Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, October uh, Ontario Open Library Network uh, community webinar. We do these most months on the second Tuesday of the month at noon uh, Eastern time. Today we are talking about uh, campus grant programs at uh, four of our Ontario colleges and universities as a way to incentivize OER work on campus. And we're joined by um, four sets of, of panelists from four different uh, institutions that are all running different uh, grant programs. We've got Ryerson, from Ryerson University, um, Ann Ludbrook, and Sally Wilson from the libraries. From uh, Seneca College, we've got Jennifer Peters. Uh, from the University of Ottawa, uh, Melanie Brunet. And from McMaster University, Joanne Kehoe and Olga Perkovic. Uh, and I am Lillian Hogan-Doran, the acting manager of Open Educational Resources at eCampus Ontario, here to facilitate your questions. And in the background is my dog. So we've got a large group today uh, joining us and not a ton of time this hour. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We'll start with uh, Ryerson University, uh, who's going to give us a little overview of their grant program, followed by Seneca, Ottawa, and then McMaster. And then we'll have a chance to do some general Q&A, anything you want answered from, from these folks about running a grant program on their campus. Um, I'm sure they, they are very, very well qualified to answer that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Anne and Sally. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, so Anne, you can take it away. Hi, um, so we're from Ryerson Library. Um, we have an OER uh, grant program since 2018. It's Anne Ludbrook and Sally Wilson. We work collaboratively together um, running the grant program, but there are other librarians that are increasingly getting involved. Sally, you have to advance. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So our, the origin of our grant program is paying forward funding from an e-campus infrastructure project that we had in 2017. So we did the database um, background for the e-campus publishing site. Um, and so we thought we actually asked for money to be earmarked towards um, programs that we could do to support open at Ryerson. Um, we also had a realization from previous um, open uh, e-campus Ontario um, open education grants that institutional funding did help move forward OE. It did in our campus. It certainly raised awareness for open education. Um, we also um, supported uh, with the e-learning office several OE textbook projects funded by eCampus, including right here, right now. And we had a supportive library administration. We started with $30,000 worth of funding in fall 2018. That was three $10,000 grants. And how we envisioned it was as a student experiential funding model, meaning we wanted the majority of the money to go to paying students um, to help with the textbooks. So for things like copy editing, et cetera. Um, library leadership, we think, um, does uh, help in the funding of, like funding of OER, it's a good place to be, I think, in the library. The library, we actually hosted Pressbooks since 2016, um, sort of preparing to um, do open publishing. Um, it makes, uh, doing that made the library a natural partner for all the projects that came um, through um, um, in terms of open education. Copyright often resides in library, and we found that copyright actually played quite a large part of um, uh, you know, just flight checking and um, information about um, projects. It aligns with the mission of supporting other teaching materials. So we have a digital, large digital course reading service as many other university, university libraries have. And it ties into our library strategic mandate of supporting student success, experiential learning, community and global outreach. And now it also ties into our new um, university strategic plan. We actually have open educational practices in the strategic plan, which is hopefully helpful to um, forwarding um, uh, more funding for OE over time. So the types of grants we supported from 2018 to 2020, we had um, textbook, majority were textbook grants. So we had $30,000 per year that were textbook and adaptation grants. We also had another $5,000 um, each year for the re 
review and adoption of textbooks or public domain or the creation of public domain books. Nobody ever applied for those. Um, we had lots of applications for the our OER textbook grants, um, but not for the smaller grants. There wasn't as much interest, which was surprising to us. Um, in 2020 um, to 2022, we're just announcing this grant now. We have a partnership grant with the Ted Rogers School of Management, the business faculty. Um, it's a large, one single large $40,000 grant. Um, it's, it's separated into two um, parts. One is a textbook grant for 20,000. One is uh, 20,000 for supplementary materials like test banks, et cetera. And we're hoping that a, and it's for, focused on first and second year business. Um, courses. We actually had um, an interested dean and an interested associate, de uh, associate dean in business um, who were very interested in open education. So we actually, um, they came to us first and then we um, came up with the idea of the partnership grant and they were happy to do that. Um, the, how we evaluate grants, we look at impact on students, faculty understanding of open in the application, project feasibility, the, bu the, the budget supports student experience, and that the technology can be supported by the library. Um, as well, we have a rubric where we, um, we look at the grants with the, um, our, our teaching office. And um, this, the, this year it will also be with TRSM and librarians. So there's, it's a cross university um, rubric assessment. Okay, so Anne's given us a little bit of background and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the more operational side of things. So in terms of the library supports for these funds, what we offer is fund administration. So instead of giving the funds directly to the faculty members, we have it all in one big, um, one big pool and we look after administering it. So this means all the expenses are channeled through us, receipts are submitted to, to us, and we do things like setting up the student contracts as well. So there are advantages and disadvantages of this and one of the advantages is it gives us a bit more control over how the money is spent and ensure that people are spending it the way that they've said they're going to spend it and it also means at the end of the project if there are monies left over um, it comes back to the library and we can pay that forward into the next year of funding. Um, we also offer onboarding sessions for all the, the grant winners. So these are usually one and a half hour sessions. We get everybody together and we sort of go through everything that we do to support these projects and give them information about budgeting and that sort of thing. Um, we also provide Pressbooks training sessions and support. So for each of the projects, they get their own individual Pressbooks training and that can be tailored to their particular project. And then we do the initial basic one. And if they want additional training later, more advanced press books, we do that. We also offer some limited project management, not very much. They're pretty much on their own to manage the projects, but we do um, check in and we consult with the, the grantees. Um, in addition to the, the supports that we provide for the grant winners, we also have general publishing supports within the library. And these fall into two main categories. So we have uh, work study students, in 2019, we hired one for the complete summer and then that person also worked part time in the fall and winter. So they were working on general publishing projects, but they could also spill over into the grant projects. So they did things like image research, um, press books, questions, and also they did some work with formulas using LaTeX. And as Anne mentioned, right now we have three librarians who are working with these grant projects in the areas of copyright accessibility and the press book sort of administration stuff, but with the um, the Ted Rogers business grant, we will also bring some other librarians on board there. And we also provide libguides. Um, these are a few lessons learned from running the projects. One thing we really wish we'd done was had signed agreements with um, the winners of the, the grants. Um, I think this would have helped them realize the time frames and also um, using third party materials. We've had a few problems with third party materials in the books. Um, we've also learned that the projects take much longer than you think. For each of the grants, we've had year-long projects, but a lot of them have spilled over. We've only had one sort of OER superstar who's been able to manage her proje projects completely and get them finished within the year. Um, some of the issue is our problem for initially when we set up the projects, it took us a long time to set up the, the funding and the grant, um, the financial stuff with our financial department. And then part of the problem with the timing is the, um, the people working on the projects, they tend to underestimate the amount of time. 
One thing we wish we'd done is ask for first chapter prototypes for the books too, because this would allow us to sort of nip things in the bud if people sort of went off track a bit. And, bit. and we did have one project that was completely done in InDesign, and then we had some issues trying to pull that into Pressbooks later in the project. Um, hand in hand with the first chapter prototypes are communication sort of check-in meetings. Those would be very useful to do. And then we also have to remember to build in time, as Anne mentioned, for a flight check. So sort of once the projects are finished, the, um, the grantees may think that they're completely finished, but then we have to go in and do a certain amount of work to make sure the projects are ready for publication. Um, it's just a couple of slides here of the various projects that we've done. So these were the 2018-2019 projects. And then these are the 2019, 2020 ones, they're upcoming. So they're all being worked on right now. And a couple of these projects have indigenous perspectives. So when we awarded these grants, we, made, we gave conditional offers to them and then um, asked them to make sure that they had indigenous consultation as part of their budget. And then I'll just leave you off with the final slide, which is a link to our complete catalog of our open educational resources and public domain works and our contact information there. So I'll just stop sharing here. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Sally and Anne. You're reviewing a lot of uh, work in a very short period of time that we've given you today. And I'm, I'm sure that folks are gonna have a lot of questions. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn it over before we get into questions to Jennifer Peters at Seneca College, which has been running um, running an, uh, an OER grant program for about the same amount of time. And I, I can't wait to hear about uh, things that are the same and the things that are different and how that's going. Great, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm Jen from Seneca and we started our grant program back in fall 2018. And it was actually because eCampus, they used to offer these grants for adaptations of textbooks. And when the government changed over, I don't think they were able to do the call that they were hoping to do. So I approached my VPA, Laurel Sholin, and I said, we're not going to be able to do adaptations through eCampus um, this semester. And she said, well, we need to do our own thing then. So she actually put together this call and we put out a call and we decided to do funding, funding of one course release for one semester. Just to start off, we didn't know what to start with. And um, the adapted text was supposed to be due by April 2019 but uh, it was actually delivered a semester later. So we learned from that. And so our second call that we did, we now increased it to one course release for two semesters. And, uh, and you know, we're getting closer to the deadline now. The text was due January 2020. It was actually delivered just a month later. So we figure we'll stick with that model. Our third round came in March 2020, and you can remember what happened in March 2020 when everything got locked down. And so I reached out to the VPA and said, do we still want to do this? And she said, yes, it's more important now than ever. And um, so that, again, was one course release for two semesters. And that adapted text is supposed to be due in January, but there's going to be a delay, and I'll tell you about why. So it's very difficult to quantify what our course releases are worth in terms of dollar amounts because the course release pays for the backfill of a, another teacher coming in to teach for that semester or those two semesters. So it could be 5,000, it could be 8,000. It dep really depends on the, the particular person that's being hired. So uh, we do not give money. We do not hand people a check. We do time. So it's, uh, it's more, we give you time to work on this. And um, something I'll talk about a little bit later on is that a lot of faculty, there actually choosing to do this now on their own PD time. So we have uh, an extra two months of PD that faculty get every three or four years. And a lot of faculty are choosing to use those two months now to work on adapting an open text. So in terms of our grant program, though, what we focus on are adaptations of open text. We're not creating textbooks from scratch. And we focus on high enrollment courses. We want to get as much bang for our buck as possible, reach as many students as possible. And we want to make sure we include colleagues from across the college. So we want the day programs, the evening programs, the weekend programs. We want to make sure that all the faculty are, are involved in making decisions. Of course, we want to support the course learning outcomes. Uh, it's got to be inclusive, so accessibility, but also equity and differentiated content. And it has to support creative teaching and assessment strategies. So instead of just plain text, there has to be something in there. 
So our first two books, this was from our first grant call. Um, we got an introduction to business adaptation and an organizational behavior adaptation. So this were, these were high enrollment courses. The text cost was fairly high um, before, go, before. And so these are estimated costs of what we were able to save students in a year. And um, the estimate is based on 50% of the students having bought the text before up to 75% of the students having bought the text before. It's kind of hard to estimate because not every student buys it. So that's kind of just a ballpark. And then our next two uh, calls, one uh, resulted in two operations management books, one at the degree level and one at the diploma level. And then the most recent one is project management. So this was supposed to be delivered by January. But when it was submitted, our VPA saw that and thought project management is something that's used in so many different courses across the college. So Shelley, who had submitted just for her students, now she was asked to work with the entire college to, de to develop something that could be used by everybody. So you can imagine that's a massive project and that, so that's definitely going to take longer than was expected. And so her course release will just be extended for an, you know, another semester likely. Oh, and also the plus symbols there that I have for operations management and project management, that's because those are those faculty students that we're talking about, but we feel like those could be used by so many other different programs. So really, we don't know the number of students that are going to be reached with those two um, books, but I'm sure it's going to be much more than that. So this is just sort of a, a general estimate based on the course codes and how many students were enrolled last year. Um, and you know, it's great to save students money, they're happy to save money too. But really, it's nice to see the faculty being able to have power over their course materials. They get so excited that they're able to customize and do exactly what they want to do. Um, faculty have complained for years by the being constrained by textbooks. So that's like, that's a massive win for them. How we support them. I'm the OER subcommittee chair, so I coordinate the open text adaptations. I consult on the technology, test the platforms, provide training like Pressbooks. I have a meeting tomorrow to, to meet with a faculty who wants to do his own project outside of our grants. Uh, I also develop the workflows for the adaptations, who, who talks to who at whatever point. And then I also worked with the bookstore to come up with a print on demand process. Obviously, it's not going to be in place right now because the bookstore is not open. So, um, you know, COVID. And then I also talk to people like you and monitor provincial, initi provincial initiatives and uh, make sure that we're on track. And then liaise with admin for additional funding. So if a faculty feels they need help with graphic design or copy editing, things like that, we often reach out to alumni and try to get them onto the projects or current students too, so that we can engage our students, whether alumni or current, to work on these projects because they have intimate knowledge with the content. And uh, managing faculty expectations is usually a big part of my job too. So uh, making sure they know I'm not going to edit their book for them. I'm not going to convert their documents. I'm not going to add page numbers. I'm not going to make the book accessible. So these are things that we hope to be able to get them support to do. But um, as the subcommittee chair, I, I don't have, I'm not able to do that. In our library, we have uh, our liaison librarians, they're involved very early on, and they help identify existing OERs that can be adapted, including alternatives to textbooks. So you might not be able to edit things, but we can also include them in lists or in uh, additional resources. So we try to have a full picture of what the faculty can use. And then we also consult for copyright citing, acknowledgements, Creative Commons licenses. That's a big thing. And then we also try to make sure that all the library staff is, is trained and aware of these initiatives going on. So we have a staff guide, liaison librarian training, and our user services training. So that if whoever gets asked the question, um, whenever they're coming into the library online now, somebody can say, oh, I can refer you or I can answer your question. So this is just a link to the adapted open text that we've produced as a result of our grants, but also as a result of just faculty having their own passion projects, or they're, they're taking their own PD time or their sabbaticals to work on these. Um, this is something that is very popular at Seneca. It's a very top down thing where our VPA, our Dean of Business, they are massive supporters of OER, so of open in general. Um, so that trickles down to the faculty and the faculty think, oh, I'm, I'm excited. I want to work on a project to do with this. 
So that's a link. And I also link to the learning portal too. That's just the College Library Ontario, um, you know, academic support site. And I will stop sharing. Thanks so much, Jennifer. It's so interesting to see um, the, what kinds of texts are coming out of Seneca and, and how um, course release works differently than, than uh, experiential learning funding. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to uh, Melanie at the University of Ottawa uh, to talk about her, their new uh, funding program that's in its first cycle and, and how that's going. Yes. Thanks, Dillian. Um, I actually don't have slides for you, but I will be sharing some links in the chat as I go along. So, um, yeah, so for a winter 2020, we had our first uh, round of the uh, U Ottawa Library OER grant program. So let me share with you the uh, a link to the information page about that in the chat. So um, we called it the OER program or and it makes it sound like it's a regular occurrence. And also it makes it sound like we have a substantial amount of money. Spoiler alert, we did not. So um, this is a, um, so there are some things that I'd like you to take away from this and I'll remind you at the end. But um, the idea is that we kept the information uh, about the amount and how established this program is purposely vague with the hope that would be keep offering this grant, uh, not just in winter 2020. So the idea is that uh, OER had been on the radar at the library for, um, for a bit, but we didn't have a specific plan or program. Uh, we actually do have one now, but the grant actually came before this. So um, in preparation for the 2019-2020 budget, uh, my manager uh, asked for $5,000 to be set aside for some undefined open or affordable education activity, and it was accepted. So um, by the end of 2019, um, also the University of Ottawa finalized its uh, strategic plan, uh, Transformation 2030, and it includes two key objectives when it comes to affordable course materials and um, an open uh, an OER. So one is to promote and reward the development of affordable learning materials and two, uh, develop open educational resources in French because the University of Ottawa is a bilingual institution and there is still quite a gap between the availability of OER in English and OER in French. Um, so with that in mind, um, we decided to make that money available to professors for the adoption, adaptation, or creation of an OER. And um, we would make the announcement of the winners uh, coincide with Open Education Week in March 2020. So, um, so there were four of us on this OER grant committee, and uh, we put together the information page that I sent the link to. Um, um, but also the form to submit the application, which is now offline because the, 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 we don't have a, an ongoing, um, um, it's not open right now. Um, we uh, created an evaluation rubric and you will see in there, and I'll show the, share the link to that. You'll see in there that um, we uh, French got some, some extra points. Uh, which we felt was in was aligned with uh, one of the strategic objectives uh, of the university. Uh, we recruited evaluators and it, that who they are is explained in the information page if you want to have a look. Uh, we created instructions for the evaluators. Uh, we had to create communication around uh, you know around the grant and then announcing the the winners but um, and then included in the university's weekly bulletin uh, also through our teaching and learning support service the two uh, professor unions the the full-time and part-time one as well as having information about um, the um, on the library homepage and some some um, some promotion on twitter so um, we turned to other OER uh, grant programs for inspiration and language. We did not start from scratch, um, either material that was under Creative Commons or with permission. And, and as you may know already, librarians are very kind and 
love sharing. So, um, so thank you, Anne, again for, for sharing that information with me. Um, so the call for application was uh, up for about a month, which we realized was a bit short, uh, but we felt we were getting like, um, timeline was getting a bit tight. So, um, so for, the, for the next round, we wanna have it up longer, but we had it up from January 29th to February 28th. So um, as mentioned, we kept some details purposely vague. Uh, the total amount available um, uh, was, um, we, we didn't say what it was, uh, but as I said, initially it was $5,000. So we just said up to $5,000. Um, and um, yeah, and the focus was on French. So we, we privileged um, uh, projects that uh, had a French component uh, that also were high enrollment or could be used in multiple courses. And um, so we received 10 applications, um, which I anonymized and for which I did a bit of research if it wasn't clear or that, that other resources of this kind did not exist. Um, so, um, and the good news is that by the time we were done uh, evaluating the, uh, the applications, we were able to find an additional $5,000 in the library's budget for a total of 10,000. So two grants were awarded the, two, the, the top two applications. Uh, then as we were completing the 2019-2020 fiscal year, um, early during the, the, the pandemic, uh, another $5,000 was found and we awarded a third grant. So we did, ended up awarding a total of $15,000 in um, uh, during this round, which is great. So I'll just share with you in the chat, the link to the announcement for, of the, the recipients. So one is in translation, one is in, in education, one is in chemistry, um, one is a book. But the other two, they're, they're video components, so they're not necessarily open textbooks. Um, and all with the end goal of having the, an English and a French version. And translation, the, the cost of translation is obviously one type of expense that, that is admissible for this grant. Um, again, due to the nature of, of the, the bilingual nature of the university. So uh, I'm happy to report that we're, we're able to secure $10,000 for, for this year's round, uh, which will be announced next month. Uh, and that's all thanks to um, our associate university librarian in open scholarship and digital initiatives, who actually really is a big supporter of OER. So, uh, so yeah, I think it was mentioned before, if you can find like one champion um, that, that's, you know, that helps with finding funding, it's great. Um, so here are the three, three takeaways from, from this. One, I don't think you have to wait until you have a multi-year commitment to, have, to start offering grants. Uh, two, you don't have to wait until you have a large dedicated budget for this. Um, you can always add later, uh, combine forces with other units on campus, uh, and be on the lookout for any unspent money. That's basically what happened. Whenever I would hear about, you know, well, we got this money. Oh, can we use it for this? And I'm, yeah, sure. So be on the lookout for that unspent money and use it for that. Uh, and, if, and finally, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like you, you turn to existing programs and their organizers like you're doing now because we're happy to share documentation and processes. So I hope this was helpful. If you, I'm gonna add my email address in the chat if you have any follow-up questions after, uh, after today's uh, webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, I'm so happy to hear that you've been able to find more funding to continue uh, the program. And um, I love that you guys just um, pulled this together and just grew it and kept collecting and, and gathering. I think it's really inspirational for folks that, that might not be able to secure that large funding, multi-year funding. Um, and I, 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 I really appreciate you, uh, you sharing that. With us. Um, so before uh, before we move on to to a Q, open Q and A for everybody, uh, we've got one group left from McMaster University has also just started um, their program, uh, and we've got Olga with us from the library as well as jo uh, Joanne from the Teaching and Learning uh, Center, um, uh, who are going to take us through uh, what's going on at at Mac right now. Thanks, Lillian. I'm just going to share our slides, and Olga is going to start. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, um, 
The McMaster OER grant is in the amount of $16,000 per year for the next three years. It was launched in spring 2020 and runs as a three-year pilot uh, to 2023. Um, in this first year, we have awarded funds for three projects, one adaptation and two creations. And the completion date for the first round of projects is June 30th, 2021. Uh, but what we wanted to talk about today uh, were five uh, key pieces on um, getting our grant program started. So as I think, uh, Joanne, if you can get the slideshow uh, running. I think it's running. Everyone can see this, correct? Um, and we're just seeing um, your, the, you're on the first slide and we're seeing the full Google Slides screen. Oh, hang on. <laughs> let me start. Let me try it again. No problem. Can you see that now? There we yes. go. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 So the first key piece is the importance of senior administrative support for an OER grant, uh, which we've heard from all everyone else already. In our case, building understanding and raising awareness of the advantages of using OER and in particular open textbooks has been one of the university library's uh, key strategic initiatives since 2017. Uh, using this initiative and building on a recommendations report from the OER committee to the library leadership group in 2018, we made a pitch for funds for an OER grant. Uh, several OER grants were being offered in other institutions at the time, so this concept was familiar to library administrators, and they agreed that this would be a good approach to take to advance this initiative. Library administrators have access to other campus partners who might be invested in OER or other senior units of the institution who might be interested in investing funds for, an, for a grant. In our case, the McPherson Institute for Teaching and Learning had just invent, invested funds to help in the creation of McMaster's first open te textbook, Essentials of Linguistics by Katherine Anderson. And the McMaster Students Union Executive had made previous requests for uh, funding for OER to the Office of, this, of the Provost. So the university librarian was able to approach these units for modest amounts of funding over multiple years. Uh, the funders supported a multi-year project since this would allow for a proper evaluation over time and would also result in a building a good foundation for OER. The second piece is the importance of seamless, of developing a seamless application process. So to do this, uh, first create a subgroup um, of an OER committee or a comparable, comparable group to work with um, for you to create your documentation. In our case, including an instructor who had applied for and received a creation grant from eCampus Ontario was valuable since the instructor provided insight into the kind of information that might be helpful for us to ask applicants in order to properly evaluate them. It might be worthwhile to take the time to review applications from other institutions to see what might be suitable for your institution. The subgroup reviewed examples of other OER grant applications, which was helpful since some included a request for a project plan or a timeline in the, in the um, application process, which proved to be a valuable component um, and important part of the application process. The application process should also be made transparent. We added all the documentation that we created for the OER grant on the OER committee LibGuide. Um, I've included a link to the LibGuide on the slide and there's also a link to the application form that we created using Microsoft Forms. On the LibGuide, you'll find that the eligibility of applicants and grantee expectations are clearly defined. And we also identified and defined the criteria on which submissions will be evaluated. Okay, no, it's my go. So the application form that's on there, um, I just created a duplicate version so you can duplicate it for yourself if you want to customize it for your own institution. Um, and we did have following the, uh, uh, creating all the documents. We had, a, as Olga mentioned, a really transparent and multi-perspective evaluation process. So we had faculty, um, staff, students, and continuing ed teaching and learning staff evaluating the applications that we received. We received nine in total. Um, the evaluation criteria was tra pretty transparent. So I'll just link to that LibGuide that Olga mentioned and show you that we have 
all of the information about the grants, the, the types, the application form, the process, and then listing that evaluation criteria. Lots of the things that were that were mentioned earlier by like the um, colleagues that presented earlier today. Uh, but we really did want to highlight and emphasize the potential impact on cost savings to students. Oh, let me go back to the slides. And so we had a smaller group, we received nine applications in total, um, mostly for creation, but also um, one for adaptation and two peer reviews. We had a pretty uh, easy review process. So I can, uh, there's a link there to our process, which is again, just a form. Um, we had all of the, uh, uh, of the memberships of our evaluation committee review each of the applications. And it was really easy because using the form, you get the spreadsheet at the end and, and each of the, um, the evaluation criteria was ranked and weighted accordingly. So that was an, a pretty easy process. So once we got together, it was really quick. I think we only met for about an hour. It was really clear what the front runner, who the front runners were this first go around. And before we evaluated, we did want to spread the word. So that was the result of spreading the word through a, a clearly defined communication strategy. And Olga and I really worked together with our university advancement um, to have a story on the McMaster Daily News. We had stories on the library page as well as including um, the opportunity available through the grant and our teaching and learning website and weekly newsletter. We did email previous uh, open event attendees. So we had, we had lots of events over the years, with open access week and open education week. Um, so we, we clearly these people who attended these events had an interest already in open education. We thought we'd tap into that by letting them know about this opportunity. We held drop-in information sessions um, between announcing the grant and awarding the recipients. So, and we also incorporated these the, the opportunity to apply or explore and apply for possibly apply for the grants in our faculty development workshops. So, we had workshops on Pressbooks and H5P and open pedagogy, um, just to kind of tie it into um, the interest that may be building. Particularly because we were we had you know the dates for our launch. Um, aligned with the um, working remotely as a, in response to the pandemic. So there was a lot of more, lot more interest in open education. So we kind of tried to leverage that as best as we could. And as far as we announced our grant recipients through the same kind of mechanisms through the library website and the teaching and learning um, newsletter. We, unlike Ryerson, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about having management over that the budget, we distributed the funds to the departments that the project leads were a part of. So. They are completely responsible for their, their budget. They do have, a, have to report to us on how it's spent. And there were some criteria on what could and couldn't be included, um, which we think we'll evaluate a little bit more closely next year because there were some questions afterward. Uh, Olga and I held a kickoff meeting with each of the project leads to try to determine what kind of support they might need from us as far as uh, you know, the pedagogical support, support with the technology platforms. And we anticipate showcasing some of the work that they've done so far in this first go around during open access week, which I think is next week. Um, yeah, so there's a link there to the activities that we're having and one of the one of the ones included is a webinar with each of the project leads talking about their process so far are the ones that we awarded. I thought it'd be interesting just to share was an adaptation on um, for a macroeconomics textbook. Uh, virtual uh, creation for a virtual field trip. Um, textbook but it's going to be kind of cool because it's incorporate lots of videos from actually going on a virtual or on a field trip and recording some um, geographical formations in northern Ontario and then we have a creation for a biochemistry interactive manual so those are the three that were awarded this year and I think um, we're gonna have the questions now but there's our contact info if you want to get in touch with us and again we're happy to share any of the documents we kind of wrote on the coat trails of, of lots of the people who had done this work before us so uh, we're really grateful to to them um, for sharing, being able to share some of that with us. So hopefully the sharing can continue to, to move forward. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Joanne and Olga and, and everybody for, for sharing um, what's going on with your grant programs. It's so inspiring to see that you all are sort of building on each other's success and, and then also tailoring programs to sort of what makes sense at your own local institution. So um, I am going to open it up for questions for, for the group or for anybody specifically. Now, I just wanted to make sure with four sets of panelists that everybody got their, their time. Um, and you can feel free to you know, either raise your hand, throw your question in the Q&A, or um, I, 
those are really the options that you have for asking questions. Um, we've got uh, one question uh, in the, in the Q&A that Jennifer started to answer, um, which is, do these resources include ancillary resources? And I, uh, I, I see that Seneca's don't and that uh, Ryerson's do. So I thought that maybe uh, one, some uh, we could weigh in from Melanie and from Olga and Joanne and also to hear about sort of why, why those decisions were made. Uh, I'll answer on behalf of Mac. Um, the uh, macroeconomics uh, adaptation does include, and so it's largely focused on development of, an, of a question bank. So I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with what Rajiv Gianjani did with his, I forget which textbook it was, but about having his students create the question bank as an assignment. So it's, she's, I mean, Rajiv has been wonderful and be, getting in touch with the faculty member on this question and sharing his um, his process. So um, we're definitely have included adaptation in, in our go round. Um, I was just going to say that uh, for us, um, the at U of O, like the grant can be used for, you know, any of the, you know, adopting, adapting and, and creating. Um, mostly the ones that the, the three that were awarded so far were mostly creation. Uh, however, um, it does remind me that for the next round, I think we might want to be clearer about, you know, creating ancillary materials would be like a good option because, you know, um, I know that some people might be interested in creating something, but do they want to do like the whole thing? Like, well, I want to create an open textbook and, and like, it, it's a big job. So maybe, um, yeah, like being more clear about creating ancillary materials for things that already exist is also a nice project in itself. So, yeah. So this is Anne. Um, one of the reasons why we decided to embed ancillary resources so heavily into the TRSM um, grant is because faculty actually asked for that. It was their feedback in particular. We're really trying to target right now. Our other grants have not necessarily targeted first or second year courses or high enrollment courses. So what we want to do now is really target high enrollment courses. We had um, uh, almost gotten a grant uh, with a grant from the student union, but unfortunately we had a student union scandal and everything fell apart last year for us. Um, but we had been working a couple of years on getting a grant with the with the students and that was definitely surrounding ancillary materials. And um, so when we talked to business faculty, their response was we can't do a first or second year course without ancillary materials. It would be impossible to take and adopt an already existing open textbook and then adopt it without ancillary materials like test banks. So we just responded to that and made sure that we built that into our grants. And I'll just sort of reiterate what I said about Seneca is that it's not included in the grant and we say that right in the call for proposals. We say that ancillary materials are not part of the grant, but what we're finding is that the chairs of that particular school, they will hire an other than full time faculty to build those materials as the faculty is adapting the text. So they sort of get other folks on board to work on these projects that have taught that course before. So that seems to be our experience. Thank you guys. I really, uh, I really appreciate uh, the variety of perspectives. Uh, Jennifer, I like that even though you're not including ancillaries, that people are really finding their own way to do it and getting buy-in from their own, um, from their own departments uh, or, or schools to be able to, to do that work. Um, I have questions if no one else has <laughs> questions. Um, I've noticed that each of you d distributes funding in a very different way. Jennifer, you guys uh, fund based on course release uh, and time. Uh, Sally and Anne, you guys choose to, to, um, to, to take a little bit more control over the funding and how it's, how it's distributed. And uh, other folks have a direct release of the funds to the teams to just see, um, see what happens. Um, can, I was hoping uh, each of you could speak to you know, something that, that's good about the way that you release funding and, and something that's a challenge based on the way you release funding. Well, Sally can talk more about the challenges because she does a lot of the management, but where ours originated from is that our learning and teaching um, uh, or the cent now the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, they actually have a grant program um, every year and they um, do a very similar administration of funds. So we modeled our funding and our administration um, 
to align with their model. But Sally That's can really, speak to the, yeah. the challenges well, as, of that. <laughs> as I mentioned, there's, there's pros and cons. I mean, it gives us a bit more control. And if there's any money left over, it remains in our hands. But then the disadvantage is we're spending a lot of time chasing down receipts and learning how to do things with our financial department that, you know, we really don't know how to do. So that it's, it's time is, is the big issue. Yeah. It's interesting because um, at Mac, we had we have a very large student partner program, so we um, would administer the funds for that at, at the Teaching and Learning Center. But it got so large <laughs> that we ended up um, distributing the funds to the departments who have the student partner pro projects. And that's mm -hmm. why we decided to kind of follow that um, shift with the open grants. Uh, but uh, like I was mentioning, I think there are some questions about what, what we should define as being eligible expenses. So um, sometimes they fall a little bit outside of that, but because it was a pandemic, we're like, okay, you can buy that really expensive camera <laughs> because they couldn't borrow it from, from an on-campus place. So we've been a bit flexible. And the, the course release model, it works really well if the faculty is strong in time management and project management. Um, so working with business faculty is usually fine, but sometimes, um, even though it's one course release, sometimes that cannot feel like a lot of time. So you really have to carve out that specific time for yourself in your schedule or else it's going to get eaten up by uh, all your other courses that you're teaching and other work that you're working on. So it's um, helping the faculty prioritize the project and really set um, check-ins where we can make sure that they're on track. Um. For us at U Ottawa, um, we uh, because we were trying to uh, make sure that the money was being used as we were getting closer to the end of the fiscal year, uh, we ended up being very very practical about it, and also that meant like not having a whole lot of control. Um, but basically, we tr we transfer the funds to the uh, to the um, to the individual, like in their in their research fund. They give us their number, and we the library transferred that money to to that. Um, in the application um, form or the the process, we we clearly outline what are some eligible expenses, and and it does not include uh, you know. A professor paying themselves like while they're doing this. Um, we also thought that for the amount of money that we had available, that was not really, you know, it was it wouldn't really cover that. But um, but this is something that we're thinking about in the future. You know, hopefully at some point we'll have more money. But in the meantime, this was kind of the balance we we're able to reach. Okay. Um so I've got a really good question in the Q and A. Um, is anybody looking at student retention um, and these and these grants? Has anybody thought about doing some work on that? Have you seen any uh, change, not just in student savings, but also in um, you know retention statistics for courses and programs using OER? Um, we are doing research, but we're not doing research based on retention. So ours is more, more focused around perceptions. And um, we had talked about doing some research based on retention, but also student success. And one of the one of the folks at Seneca that does a lot of research, she felt that that was a bit when you get into a research project like that, it's kind of hard to exactly connect the two and say, this is the reason why these students are doing well in this course. So she wanted us to sort of avoid that, but I'd be interested to hear if other folks are exploring that. I think it would be interesting to do, for sure. I think that there would be a couple of projects we could do that with where a large amount of students are using it, like right here, right now, which was an eCampus funded project. Um, uh, so we could look to see previous numbers to this. So that would be possible. It's just that um, the number of, we're real, right now we're just trying to get the money amount. Um, we're just sort of going across all our projects over the last three years and just trying to get that as an impact. So it would be interesting to look at for sure. Yeah, for McMaster, um, this is, we're such in an early stage of our um, pilot project that um, 
I have been thinking about this a lot and we uh, one of my goals um, in the next few months is to or weeks is to work with the assessment um, a librarian that we have here at McMaster and just see what kind of assessment we can do um, as a result of the projects once they're completed um, to see what approach we should take but I think for us it's early days and I'm really interested to hear about what other people have done for their projects in terms of assessment. Yeah, I think that um, I think I think it's really interesting. I think retention is a bigger issue now than it was uh, six months ago uh, as, as well. Um, but I'm going to drop a link in the in the chat to the Open Education Group's OER review project that does sort of a comprehensive lit review of, of studies on OER efficacy. Um, and I, I believe that some of the studies do have some information, even if it's coming from outside of Ontario. On, um, on on retention uh, rates. I know that there is work being done, but I, I think primarily in the United States where education is more of a capitalist endeavor um, and, and retention is, is more of a funding metric. Um, so we're actually running uh, low on on time. Uh, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say a really big thank you to Jennifer and Sally, Melanie, Olga, and Joanne for all uh, participating with us uh, today. I, I think um, it's so exciting to me to see um, not just these four campuses but other campuses in Ontario um, managing OER work locally, building local expertise, building local champions. Um, so we will provide the, uh, the, the notes, uh, any slides that you folks have, have shared, um, if I can grab them from you, I'll make sure to uh, provide them as well and um, send that out with the recording after, after this um, session is uh, online and uh, transcribe and everything. Um, we are usually do these every month, but uh, next month we are not going to be doing an OOLN webinar. Uh, instead, we would highly encourage you to attend either a North American or a global uh, open ed conference. Um, there are two happening in November and we don't want to interfere um, with either of them. Uh, so I know there's a lot of amazing work being done in Ontario and I know a lot of that is being shared um, at the Open Education Conference and at the Open Education Global <laughs> Conference, November 9th through 13th and 16th to 20th, respectively. Um, I, 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 I know you'll be able to hear about projects happening here in this province, but also pro 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 projects that are happening outside of the province um, that are really um, exciting. And eCampus Ontario will be hosting the Eastern Time Zone for the Open Education um, Global Conference. So uh, we know that there'll be some really great presentations coming from, from folks in our, our province, including a keynote pr uh, panel that features uh, Ontario students and their perceptions. On, on open. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check those out, if you don't have Zoom burnout yet, we would really encourage you uh, to, to do that. And, and we'll be back with um, webinars in, in December. Again, thank you all so much, everybody, for coming. I have a wonderful rest of your uh, slightly shorter uh, week. And, and we'll, we'll see you on, on the Slack and on Twitter and um, on emails and we're around. Thanks, Lillian.